sound like you're having fun. This is a good conference. How many say this is a good conference? Amen. It really is. In more ways than one. You know, next Saturday I'm going to be uh, hosting or organizing, well, not organizing, it's already organized, a metro urban conference in Los Angeles at the Union Rescue Mission. I wish I could take all of you there. You'd really light a fire to that conference. But uh, I want you to know that uh, I know that what you're doing is God's will for this moment, for our hour, for this world. And uh, I truly respect what you're doing. I uh, was 17 years old when I planted a church between a bar and a dance hall in New Mexico. I was 19 years old when I went, my, my wife and I went to pastor, took a church. So if God can use me, he can use you. You're never too young. I was 21 years, when I, uh, years old when I went to Bible school to teach. Little did I know that I get people from Philadelphia, New York, and all over the world to... Uh, to teach and to learn. You've heard of Nicky Cruz. Well, he was in my ca class of evangelism. Sonny Argensoni, Freddy Garcia, Victor Torres. These people have huge urban ministries today. I learned from them. I was their teacher and took them out to the streets to witness, and the teacher would come out empty, could not get anyone to commit to Christ, and yet my students all over the place were committing others to Christ. So sometimes the students are better than their teachers, but it's all in God's purpose. It's all in God's purpose. So never underestimate what you're able to do and to use the excuse that God will not use you. He used me. He can use you as well. And this evening, I want to challenge you and probably perhaps more than anything, inspire you to keep doing what you are already doing. And I want to read a scripture from Hebrews 11.7. By faith, and this is the message from Eugene Peterson, by faith, Noah built a ship in the middle of dry land. That's faith. When it's dry and not a cloud in sight, that is faith. He was warned about something he couldn't see. So there's revelation there. But also, and acted on what he was told. There's obedience. The result? His family was saved. So it's foundational. The heart of a neighborhood is the family. The strength of a church is the family. So he's getting down to brass tacks. He's getting back to where it begins. He, his act of faith drew a sharp line between the evil of the unbelieving world and the rightness of the believing world. Kept him separate. He drew a line. His act, not his theology, not his doctrine, or you see, young people, the sin of the church, it's not doctrine, but practice. That our theology is not integrated to our behavior. We need to be salt of the earth and light in the world today. So this is what he's doing, defining in an age of relative truth. He said, this is right, that is wrong, this is goodness, that is evil. Don't be afraid to draw the line. This is what Noah was doing. As a result, Noah became intimate with God. Noah became intimate with God. I, I would have said he was intimate, then he did all these things. But I think that God, after we do work, then he becomes intimate with us know God and make him known. And, and, and here's a model of relation, a model of transformation, 
a model to achieve what God wants you to achieve and what we, the church, has not done in our cities. And so let us pray right now. Father, we praise you. We thank you that you're in this place today. We thank you that you are just beckoning young people to come to serve you. What others have not been able to do that these young people are able to do. I thank you, Lord, that you have called each and every one of them and that you have a place, a special place, for an hour such as this in our hurting cities that you have brought them. It takes courage. It takes patience. But above all, it takes a calling. Thank you for calling them to your service. May you, this evening, just give them a touch of your will, touch of your glory, that they would leave this place saying, it has been good being with God and one another. Amen. You know, uh, when I come to a conference such as this and see so many of you that are doing so much for God, it said, what can I tell them that they aren't doing already? And so I uh, heard a story that perhaps... Uh, explains how my feeling as to how I come to approach you this uh, evening. It is said that this speaker, much sought after speaker, uh, was called from this village, uh, insisted on him to come, and finally he was able to come. And when he finally came, he stood up. Everybody was anxious to learn from him and all he said was this, you only learn what you already know. You only learn what you already know. And he asked, how many of you know anything? And nobody raised their hand. Well, if you don't know anything, then you can't learn anything. And he left. And that shocked him. He said, no, that wasn't right. Let's call him again and see if he has another message or explains the one he just gave us. So they called him the second time. And he came back the second time, and they again listened and said, okay, let's see what he says now. And he came up and he said, you only learn what you already know. Wow. How many of you know something. And they all raised their, ha their hand this time. And he said, well, if you already know, what can I teach you? And he left. <laughs> huh, that's not right either. The third is a charm. So they brought him the third time. But this time they prepared for him. This side here will say, yes, we know. <laughs> and this side here says, no, we don't know. So they were waiting for him. And when he came up again, same old tune. You know, some preachers, that's all we know, just one sermon and repeat it over and over. <laughs> so he said, <laughs> I see I have some preachers here. Okay. You only know, learn what you already know, he told them. They knew it already, and they smiled, and this side, Raise their hand. Yes, we know. And that one raised their hand. No, we don't know. Ah, he said. Well, in that case, those that know, would you teach those that don't know? And he laughed. It was not till a week later that someone, a wise old man, had a dream. And he said, this is what he was trying to tell us that the knowledge is within the people. My philosophy and teaching, that learning is not filling an empty glass, but learning and teaching is polishing a precious diamond in the rough. I tell my students that if I make a mistake as a professor, my mistake is to believe more in you then you believe in yourselves. So when I stretch you and I 
put you to the limit and I give you assignment and really make you work, it's because I see what you don't see. And I just pray that you would be able to see the potential that I see in you. And I would hope that you would also be able to uh, see in others. I guess the moral of this story is human nobleness is not dead. It is just asleep. And it's up to you to awaken that with that goal. With that, go into the city. There's been analysis. There's been a lot of assessment. But remember that the Word of God says we have all been created by God. I know. I was poor. I was in the city. My father never earned more than $5 an hour. My mother was a housemaid. We were poor and I didn't know it. In fact, I thought we were the richest one people in the neighborhood because we had the most junk cars in our backyard. <laughs> but you know, from that I learned. I sat in those cars many a day. I didn't have no Power Rangers or no Pokemon. Those were my toys. And I remember hearing the old folk, my grandfather, you know, talking to neighbor across the, the fence and say, you know, vecino, you know, neighbor, that car, I'm going to go back to Mexico one day. And see that car over there? That's going to take me. Yeah, that's a good car. All it needs is a motor. And all it needs is a transmission. But it'll get me there. These Junk cars were my toys. I used to sit in them, call my friends from the barrio, and say, get in, get in. I was always the driver. <laughs> and so I would sit there and say, okay, now we're going to California. Here we were in New Mexico. I've never heard of California. Not even seen it in the map, but I've heard about it from others. I've never seen it. Don't know nothing about it, but we're going. And there we are, just plain. See the mountains, see the desert. Oh, our imagination. We can hope. We can dream. And that's what keeps us. Some of our old folk died, never went back to Mexico, but at least they, came, they left with a smile on their face, dreaming that they would get there. That's what we capture. That's the good news of the gospel, that people that hope, that people that have dreams. See, and, and we learn within our family. The knowledge is within our family. I learned more lessons from my family than I did from books. You see, I was going to, to school. See, my name is really Jesus Miranda, not Jesse. I went to school. First day of school, teacher looks at the roster and sees a name, and she calls me and says, is this your name? Yes. Pronounce it. And I said, Jesus Miranda. She says, well, here it says Jesus. I said, that's my father's name, Jesus. She says, well, I can't pronounce it. And I'm not about to call you the name of our Lord. So your name is Jesse. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jesse. So that evening, at supper time, my father said, well, how was your day at school? First day in school. I said, Dad, great. I'm another person. You know, education does great things, but that's a miracle, you know. And he said, what happened? And I said, I told him. They changed my name. Teacher couldn't pronounce it, and apparently she doesn't want to call me Jesus. My father looked at me and laughed. 
Imagine if we would have called you or given you the name of your uncle, Jose Maria. <laughs> Joseph Mary, she would have really flipped her lid. <laughs> son, you are not another person. You're still my son. You are still who you are. Labels are one thing. How life describes you is one thing. How you define yourself is another. That's a lesson from the barrio. How important it is, our self-image, that we know who we are. In the barrio, of course, they come in the old buses and pick us up and go to church. Father Catholic, my mother Methodist, and I turned out Pentecostal. <laughs> but we learned. We learned. They took me to church, and my parents wouldn't go to church, so they put me on the bus, and I'd go to vacation Bible school. How many know what that is all about, okay? Yeah. You're doing something great. And so I came one day and said, Mom, I don't know. I, I, I'm not appreciated there. I'm not included. And she says, why? Well, they sang this little chorus. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. And I said, I'm brown. I wasn't included. <laughs> she said, yes, you were. Notice the last part. Those that are precious in his sight. That is you. Hallelujah. How important it is. So we learn pluralism and diversity early on. When I was 13, 14, I was asking questions, and I'd say, you know what? The Catholics never opened the Bible, Dad. Mom, the Methodists never get to the book of Acts. They read the Bible, but never get to the book of Acts. Uh, but then they both gang up on me and sees, and the Pentecostals never leave the book of Acts. <laughs> so today that I'm teaching in the school of theology, I remember that I'm more eclectic because I was brought up that way and it was in the barrio, the best school that you can have. So note that this is not a deficit model that I am presenting to you. It is not to see what's wrong with the world. I'm saying what is right with the church, what is right with the word, what is right with each one of you that go there. Assess that, and you'll find out that you're in the right course. But let me tell you, since those nice days of childhood that helped, for my world, my mind, my mindset. It helps me today as I'm teaching in a university, teaching uh, pastors, going throughout the world, speaking at pastoral conferences, and I say, learning is change. And it's happening faster than we imagine. Right now, living, we're living in a fluid culture. Ministry is like shooting at a moving target. That's what it's about. It's not easy. Now, in, in, in the university, in the seminary, we say we're living between paradigms. We're in the middle of the river. Here's a bank and there's a bank. A, de a world is dying and another one to be born. What's it going to be like? I don't know. But right now we call it postmodernism. Today we call it a post-Christian era and periods. Your people in the, in the urban scene, people in the barrio, in the ghetto, they have a sense that something's wrong, that cannot articulate it. They don't have the vocabulary, but they know something is wrong. And sometimes the leaders are the ones that don't even know what changes are taking place. You need to bring security and understand that we're living through very difficult times. A paradigm means that there are rules that are set 
There are boundaries that are set, but we live in an age that those rules are changing. And those boundaries are fluid, and they're changing. And so we, we're so used to the linear way of thinking that when things get a little more dynamic and not as static, we are lost. But how many know that Jesus is the same yesterday, he is the same today, and he will be the same tomorrow? There is stability. There is a foundation. We are building upon a rock, but right now everything seems so changing. But you need to have perspective and see what is happening out there. Some of us don't see the big picture. We go out putting out fires here, putting out fires there and not answering the basic questions of life, of meaning, of significance. And when it's going past us, an anthropologist by the name of Peacock says about, or tells a story about a Russian factory where a worker would come out every day and he'd come out with this wheelbarrow. And the guards at the gate would look at him coming and then as he came past them, they'd peek into the wheelbarrow and see if he had anything there. Since it was empty, they waved him on. First day, second day, one week. It wasn't until the second week that they realized the man was stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> Let it soak in a little bit. Content is one thing, container is another thing. And the container is the creation of God, the imago Dei that God has created everyone. Not everybody has a degree, not everybody has economic, not everybody has a diploma, but you know what? The container is bigger than the content that you are working for the souls and the life and the container of people. So it is important that you look at what is deep within an individual to be affirmed as a human being. The greatest contribution in the 21st century would be to understand what it is to be human. While we don't know what it is to be human, we don't know what God is like. It's only when we understand our humanness do we understand His divineness. There are people that are thinking they are God. Little gods. Don't believe the new age. We're not like God. It is sufficient to be the creation of God, our full humanness of God. The greatest discussions in the church history have not been about God's, uh, Jesus' divinity. The questions have been more about his humanity. But oh, miracle of miracles. That God loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And he became fully a man and fully God. And he's with you every step and every inch of the urban area that you find yourself in. Have you, Job was asked by God, have you seen the rivers in the sea? But Lord, but Lord, water is water. No, there are trends and there are currents and there are rivers. He that has eyes to see, would you see? Work within the urban area understanding that there are currents and trends. But above all, that God is present there. But the deepest question in ministry, especially in the urban area, are not so much questions of action, questions of reflection as we do in the seminary, but they're really questions of relation. Are you networking? Are you relating to people? Are you sitting where they sit? You've moved into their zip code. You're in their census track. 
But are you going to get into their heart? Are you going to get into their mind? Will you be there after you're gone, after a year of mission work? I believe so, that if you establish a relationship, even when you're gone, those words, that advice, your person will be in their mind and their heart, and that's the seed, the potential of growth in the future. Question. Are you under contract or are you under a covenant? Are you just filling out the time from this time to that time? Or is it you've got a commitment to God? I think it's the latter. I think you've got a covenant. I guess you're obeying God. How important that is. Is this something temporal? sociological or is this transcendental is this divine divino espiritual is it that how important it is that you see that because see right after that I would ask is this a performance or is this character is this really leaving you with something hallelujah that when you leave those streets, when you leave that address, when you shake for the last time that core group that you've been working with, what will you take with you? Character. You've learned from them. They've learned from you. Something will never be the same because you've been where God has wanted you to be. Amen. How important it is that you understand a model of achievement. And, and let me just give you the practical uh, how-tos of a model. That you be a Noah in dry land when no evidence is around of any success that you would say, by faith, I am doing this. That you go back this weekend and go there with a new vision. You do not look at circumstances. You do not look at coincidences. But you're going to look through faith that though there is a dry land here, there's going to be a flood one day. There's going to be a flood one day. Hallelujah. Now here's what Noah is telling us, okay? Don't let so many wheelbarrows go by. Stop it. Okay? Look at the container. Look at the container. Look at the bigger picture. Amen. See, the Noah principle is this. God is not giving prizes for predicting rain or a flood. He's giving prizes for building an ark to get people from here to there. You're not in the city to tell them how bad it is. They already know that. Sociologists are making a mint out of telling them how bad things are. They want to find a way to get from here to here and have faith in their life. Hope in their future. So here's the model of relation with God. He was intimate with God. He knew God. Noah became intimate with God. Some of us cannot understand intimacy. We, we like to study things from a textbook. We like to be uh, perhaps voyeurism from a distance. Secondhand information with God. It's not secondhand. It has to be firsthand. It's you, Lord, and it's me, Lord, right here in this street corner. How important it is that we learn work with promise keepers and I tell men the greatest problem why there is pornography it's because it's easy to look from the outside in instead of becoming involved and be committed to a relationship we're not testing out God this is not a laboratory it's too dangerous people are at a balance right now and you cannot play now, do I know God or don't know God? You better know him in the city. You better know him right there where you are. That is a war zone. It is not a comfort zone, as some of you are finding out. That's why I'm not in there. I teach in the 
security of a seminary. No, no, no. My zip code is also the inner city. How important it is that we understand. Because see, he said that he was warned of things to come. You want revelation? Then have relation. No relation, no revelation. Jesus said, I call you no longer servants, but I call you friends. Because a servant doesn't know what the master is doing, but a friend knows everything. The glory I receive, Lord, I have given them. So how important it is for you to know your sphere of work, your ministry, your combat zone, your field, by knowing God, and he'll reveal to you what he what the future holds. Now here's the dimensions or the lessons of bringing us from here to here, of going from an old world to a new one, from an old paradigm to a new one. Could you contribute, please, a new paradigm of doing urban ministry that is not co-opted by sociology, psychology, or economics, but it relies on the power, the transforming power of Jesus Christ? That the Holy Spirit have a place. Could you do that as a new generation of urban workers that you discover and become creative? Well, let's be like Noah. Noah saw the dimensions of the task, that it was not a partial flood. It was a global flood. In other words, this is bigger than you and I put together. That what we are facing is not a little pool, but we are fishing in the wide world that is turning ugly, but is needing hope. And you're that hope. You're that hope. It's not regional. You're not talking of Philly. You're not talking Chicago. You're not talking L.A. You're taking, talking all of us. You're a team. You work together. You have the same captain. And you have the same mission. The Great Commission. Work together. Use this conference for iron to sharpen iron working together and go home with a new spirit and a new container and new content. Type of leadership. Noah teaches us what kind of leader for a new world. It says that he was just and he was intimate. He was righteous. He was relational. Not just pragmatic. Not just utilitarian. So here you find Noah building an ark. His act drew the line, not his doctrine. By their fruits they shall be known. The contents. Now see, here here you don't have a state of the art ark. And this is against our mindset because we look at the church and we look at the best buildings. Carpet, air conditioning, A vehicle. I'm talking about what is the stuff are you going to bring from here to there? And how are you going to bring it? Are you going to have a vehicle to take it from here to there? What's it going to look like? I'll tell you, it's no Titanic. There's no China. The drapes are not all silk. Plush carpet, no. No. And I'm glad because the Titanic took a nosedive, you know that. Because the focus was on something else. We're not in a cruise ship, young people. We're in a battleship. You're moving forward. You are fighting the enemy. You're not out for a luxury ride. It is an uncomfort. And some of you are finding out in the little apartments they were rented for you. But you know what? You're doing God's will. Doing God's will. But notice, it was not a be- uh, the beauty was not external. The beauty was internal. See? What is the content? One says, I want you to bring living things. Everything that has life. Two and two. And that's what he obeyed and brought. Living. How many know that God 
is the God of the living. You have to have a living faith. You have to have a living commitment. This is something for life. If it is dead, you're dead in the water. You need to have life. He said, bring into the ark something living. Secondly, of every species, there's diversity. Some of us can't stand diversity. We have to have it our way. At home, that's how you had it. <laughs> but we learn at home. See, at home, I remember my father. I said, I came from a mixed family. Oh, really? Yeah. My father was from Texas and my mother from New Mexico. Texans like their tortillas this big. And New Mexicans like them this big. So guess what? Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we'd have the big tortillas. Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we'd have the little tortillas. And on Sunday, good old American bread. So we learned how to survive together. Diversity, and that's the difficulty the church is having today, but that is not reality. The city is telling us that they are red, they are yellow, they are black, they are white. We are all precious in his sight, and he will bring us all in. But something that is true, something that reproduces itself, I would hope that you would leave here and say, That's the seed of potential of a new world. That's the stuff, the clay, which the potter is able to get and shape up and says, I am doing ministry in your life, in your neighborhood. And that's the content. That's all. Don't look at the aesthetics. Don't look at the beauty of it. It is not really to show. It is not to exhibit. It is to travel. It is to transform from here to there. We, you may not be eloquent in your word. You may feel inferior because you cannot speak as well as someone else. We're not exhibiting. We're not showing off. We are doing God's word. The idea is to carry the message of Jesus Christ. Finally, the medium or the method is an ark. And in that ark, there is organization. We need to organize for diversity. Enough for events. Enough for props. Enough for assigning somebody to do the Hispanic thing or the African-American thing or the Chinese thing. No, this is the responsibility of the total body of Jesus Christ. It is the church, and we need to move it up higher to organize, because if we're not organized, we'll sink. Use your imagination. What was it like to travel in that Noah's Ark? Leave the romance, leave the heroics, leave the legacy. and don't just cast it up as literature. Look at it reality, and look at it. Imagine the stench inside. Did you ever think what kind of sewage system they had? How about water, the delivery? What were they doing? All of this, if we look at it, listen, it, the beauty was not outside, it was inside. Can you imagine? You think we fight and we argue. But he had every animal in the ark. And here's a glimpse of the millennium. Peace. The lion and the lamb in the same floor. That is God. He knows how to do it. It's not described, but it is in revelation to the mind of the friends of Jesus. And he'll say, I'll tell you what, what eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, what hasn't even come to the hearts of men and women, I have prepared for you. The God of creation.
that said, let it be light, let there be light, he can also say, let there be a program. Let there be ministry there in your street corner. God is able. Now here, water was a symbol of chaos for the Hebrews. Because creation says that the earth was empty and void. And it also says that the flood was global and that there was death. But then Jesus in the New Testament comes and says, come to the waters. It's not chaos. It is salvation. I am the living one. So the definitions change. Vocabulary and meaning changes when you come into the, the, the barrio, the ghetto, the urban area, and you present the gospel of Jesus, it becomes good news. What was death is not life. What was darkness is now light. But you know, the signs are not going to be perhaps literally, literature, academic, or spiritual. Noah got to see signs that the flood waters were going down, that it was time to come out. Because God said, look at the dove. And that dove would come, and they would see. That's how they knew it was time. I'd like for you to be dove watchers. That you go into your neighborhood and see where God is moving. The peace of God, the Spirit of God, as a dove. That's the message for John the Baptist. Jesus said, you know, you don't know. He's your cousin, but you don't know who the Messiah is. But upon who you see the dove. You know, this evening I seen the dove of God just flow over me. And saying, you know what? Something told me, even in the dining room. Wow, the potential that is here. The stuff that God has. Oh, put it, Lord, in an ark. Transport it to our cities and take the fire of God. Take the peace of God. Take the hope of God. And I believe it can be with you and in you. I know. Look at the signs. Look at God. You know, I'll close with this illustration. I became a denominational executive over 200 churches. And one day I went to San Francisco to sign a paper regarding the purchasing of a nice big building for a congregation there. When I got to the airport, two men were waiting for me, deacons of the church, and said, you know, brother, they postponed the meeting to a later hour we have really three, four hours. Would you like to go preach? And I said, oh, there must be a rally in some church. Yes, I'll go preach. I'm a preacher. I love to preach. But they took me to Mission Boulevard in San Francisco on a street corner. And I looked around and I asked, is this where we're going to have the service? And they said, yes, two 20-minute services. They began to, one got out a, an accordion and the other one a guitar. And I was shaking in my knees. They didn't teach me that in seminary. I haven't done it since I was 14, 15 years old in the street corner. 16, I was preaching in jail, so I went back then. And, and, and while I was there, I wondered, do these guys know that I just graduated with a doctorate degree from a seminary? You know, they couldn't care less. Do these guys know I'm the executive of 200 churches? They couldn't care less. And sure enough, they said, Brother, we're going to sing five, ten minutes, and then you come up and you preach. And I looked around for a pulpit to place my notes. There was nothing. 
Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've had that experience, see? And there I was. And so they sang, and sure enough, people came. And they surrounded us. So then I start, and it was finally my turn. And turn, and I started to greet people. Como están? It was in Spanish. Yo les bendiga. Gracias por venir. Thank you for being here. And then I'm hearing an echo. Somebody is just repeating, Buenas tardes. Como están? Como están? But I'm hearing an echo, and I saw these two tall fellows, long hair, beard, looked at them, turned this way, and kept on. And one of the brothers yanked my coat and said, Rebuke him, brother. But I saw the, my colleagues and imagine I was the tallest among them. And I said, no, you rebuke them. And so I kept on. And then all of a sudden, I hear God. You know that feeling, that sense? How many of you have felt that? You know that feeling that it's not an audible voice, but you have a st strong impression. Everything's fine. You rebuke them in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And here I am. Be silent in the name of Jesus. And my knees were still shaking. No sooner had I said that when one of them grasped his neck fell to his knees and his friend said help my friend he's choking you know what I knew that God was in the street corner he was alive he was well and he's taking care of us so I went to the young man and said you know what you made light of the word of God God loves you I'm going to pray don't be afraid I want you to go to church and seek God by a Bible. Because the only one I had was Spanish, so they couldn't read it. Otherwise, I would have given my Bible. And, in, and so I prayed. God healed him. And the last I remember, they were, he walked up quietly, went by, and said, thank you, thank you. I had a ca captive audience from there on. Everybody said, whoa, who's this guy? And I preached. Several people came forward. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Isn't that a great time? Hallelujah. Nikki Cruz is long gone as a student. And here I was praying for people on the street. Finally, the teacher gets it. Okay. So I prayed for them. And then had another service. And it was light with no incident. It was great. But listen, here's. Cast your bread upon the waters after many days you put it back. Two years later, I'm speaking in Guatemala. In the big stadium in the center, Mateo Flores Stadium. And I finish. It's a young people international conference of young people. And I finish speaking. And I go to the side of the, pr uh, the platform and I, and I hear feel somebody yanking my coat and he said, hermano, hermano, brother, brother, didn't you preach in San Francisco a street corner two years ago? How can I forget? He said, I was there and I came forward and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior that afternoon. He says, but two weeks later, I was deported because I was there without papers. But he's smiling. And he's saying, thank God, because I came back with the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know what? All my family now knows Jesus Christ. And I live in a little village, and there's no church that preaches Jesus. So I started to share, and guess what? I'm a pastor. Whoa. A denominational executive said, well, where's your credentials? Your MDiv degree? 
but I caught myself as, oh, this is a God thing. This is a God thing. It may be an exception, but it is a God thing. See? And then all of a sudden he says, you know what? You're my father. I am your son in the Lord. But I want you to meet your grandchildren in the Lord. And he had already instructed them way up in the, in the last row of the stadium about a hundred little Indians in their costumes stood up and they were waving. They were waving. And I mean that was a defining moment. I said, Lord, how great, how marvelous you are. Beyond our politics, beyond our boundaries, you are at work saving people. I did not see little Indians up there. What I saw were the sheaves waving. The harvest field is now. It is ripe and ready for the harvest. And today, young people, you need to open your eyes. Don't let wheelbarrows go by. Open your eyes big and see. Look at the dove. It is moving about. He is moving. And he's moving in your life today. Would you stand? I want you to do this with me. I'm a teacher. So I like the little visual aids. I did this only once. At Promise Keeper in Atlanta, 40,000 clergy. But I said, men, would you stretch your hands? And some of them hesitantly, but they did. Bishops and, you know, all these big wigs, they did it. So you do it. Stretch out. Now clench your fist. You know what that represents? Problems. Problems. Burdens. Challenges. You know what that means? Trophies, achievements that you've obtained. They hold us back from getting more of God. So I'd like for you to open your palms, shake it out. Lord, here's my problem. Here's my burden, Lord. Here's even my pride, and here's my trophy, Lord. I drop them. I drop them. Ah, shake them off. Shake them off. And now open your arms to the Lord, symbolically. They're open, Lord. And it's empty. They're empty so that you can fill it now. Fill it with your glory. Fill it with new idea. Fill it, Lord. Fill it, Lord. What I don't have, you give me. I need wisdom. I need strength. I need courage. I need money. I need substance. Lord, today give me. Hallelujah. Lord, with these hands, we build not just an ark, but like Noah, we build an altar to give you worship, to give you praise. And Noah went to the mountain, and up at that mountain, he then put together an altar. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Hallelujah. That marvelous choir that sang tonight. Worship the Lord. If he can use every, anything, he can use you tonight. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give him a clap offering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Gloria a Dios. Glory to God. Let every tongue, let every tribe, let all people glorify and bless the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now here's the last 
exercise, touch people beside you. This is a relational model. And its purpose is not just catharsis. It's not just stroking ourselves. It's transformation, what we're after. We want transformation. Transform my brother. Transform my sister. Amen. Pray for that right now. Father, I pray right now that as we are bond together with the Lord, bonds of love, bonds of mission, bonds of commitment with one another, I pray that not only do you establish networks, but that you bring transformation, transformation to our cities through this army. This is an army, Lord. This is an army. And they can do great and mighty things, Father. I leave this place with hope. I leave this place place with joy because I see another generation of committed believers, young people that will take it a step or two farther than our generation. I pass on the torch. I pass on the mantle to these your people. May you give them your grace. May you give them your power to do the mighty acts of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us praise the Lord. Thank you. Amen.